In 2013, Power Rangers was celebrating its 20th anniversary, and most of the kids that grew up with Mighty Morphin as it aired were now in their mid-twenties. Over its then two decades, the show had managed to hang on to its pop culture association without taking financial advantage of its incredible appeal. More recent seasons such as Samurai and Megaforce were airing on Nickelodeon. The relaunch for Samurai had been particularly successful as the Power Rangers name was traded off to a new generation of kid. But what about the old viewers who most fondly remembered the adventures of Jason, Tommy, Kimberly, Billy, Trini and Zack, and who now had disposable income all of their own. Though they didn't really maintain much of a social media presence, the traditional toy brand Bandai had started becoming much more visible at conventions and events with large adult fan followings. Perhaps through this, and from wanting to mark the 20th birthday of the show that started it all, they would launch a new collector subline of the Power Rangers toy line that started as a one-off experiment, but would become a prominent fixture within their toy offer for the remaining six years of their toy license. Power Rangers Legacy was born. Bandai felt that the 20th anniversary would be an important moment for the brand. At San Diego Comic-Con in 2012, they would reveal that they were working on a new version of the Power Morpher, an item that had only properly released once as an accessory to the Power Gun Sword Blaster back in the Season 1 toy line of 1993. This early prototype version was painted to look more like the original toy, but you can tell it's using the new larger mould as the power coins didn't have the ridiculous tabs to lock in. What doesn't seem to have been decided at this stage was whether it was going to be made of plastic or die cast. In the November of that year, the official Facebook page for Power Morphicon would reveal an exclusive look at the new Legacy Power Morpher, detailing its die-cast metal parts and stressing that it would be heavy. Retail price at the time was estimated at $50, with Jan to February release date in mind. It would kick off the 20th anniversary year with a bang. The announcement statement ended, This item is being made because of you fans. Your wants and demands haven't been on deaf ears. You asked for it, you got it, it's morphin' time. Fan reaction was super positive. People had been paying upwards of $50 for years to import the recent Bandai Japan Henshin devices, which Bandai USA would only make smaller copies of. And now here they were, going above and beyond with an item not targeted at kids whatsoever. When the box was first sighted at the start of 2013, it even specified 15 plus in the corner, a contrast to the typical 4 plus that mainline toys usually carry. About that box, this was nostalgia all wrapped up in a style designed to mirror the original 90s artwork, but all grown up. The 2010 Five Helmets graphic was reused, but the reversion logo was scrapped in favour of the original Mighty Morphin badge, complete with the original Saban logo. The box also wore a new logo, Power Rangers 20, which would be used across multiple items, including ones outside of the Legacy line that year. They also had gold foil on the product name Legacy Power Morpher. At this early stage, Power Rangers Legacy was not its own product category, but the way Toys R Us would badge it up on the shelf as Power Rangers Legacy Power Morpher would actually go towards suggesting what the new line name stuck with. Inside the box, you received the newly diecast plated Morpher, five diecast weighted power coins with not a tab in sight. These clipped into the Morpher using special hidden tabs and could be ejected by pressing the painted Z button for Zoo Ranger, as seen on the original, on the back of it. A bonus belt holster was also included to finish the look of the thing, and that made deploying the Morpher backwards more fun. It's important to stress how good this thing was. While the original was a bit of an afterthought packaged alongside the blaster in order to try boost sales with unknowing parent buyers and increase the relevancy of such an item, over the decades the Morpher had increased in importance and toyetic appeal as they added collectible gimmicks. This one was mostly painted instead of the original stickers. There were still a couple of stickers showing the five ranger colours on the back, but it had the accurate Power Rangers banded writing on the front rather than Mighty Morphin Power Rangers that the original had sported. 
The coins were weathered, which weirdly fit the aesthetic of looking more of a mature collectible, even though it was technically not screen accurate. And the thing even played a more polyphonic ringtone version of the Power Rangers theme song. Legacy Power Morpher was a smash hit with Toys R Us as the exclusive stockist of it who struggled to keep the thing in stock for months, demonstrating just how high demand was out there from fans looking for a premium version of something that they remembered from their childhood. Compared to the more recent Samurizer and Gose Morpher with its cardboard trading card gimmick, this thing blew the present toys away. Despite being so different to the screen used toy versions, this would quickly cement itself as the definitive version of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Morpher, and would retroactively become the canonical version used in series by Rocky and an adapted version by Tommy in the Season 25 Dimensions in Danger episode, by Jason in the Season 27 Grid Connection episode, plus by Billy, Zach, Kat, Min and Rocky again in the 30th anniversary Once and Always special. Bandai couldn't have known how much impact this one product would go on to have on the next 11 years of the franchise, but how could they? They were more fixed on Megazords. The original Megazord would become the next product to get the legacy treatment. Unlike the Power Morpher, this wasn't to be a brand new design, but actually a clever remold of something that they'd only recently created. Because in 2010, Disney had finally given up on the franchise and cancelled making new episodes of it, but had come around to the idea of revisiting the old episodes. The infamous reversioning of the first half of the first season of Mighty Morphin was born. 32 episodes were supposedly remastered with a new intro and shall we say Adam West Batman style comic effects splattered on screen during action moments. While the show would not be fondly remembered, Bandai's efforts would be as they lent into the show for a second run at the season 1 toy line. While it was intentionally different and took liberties with lots of aspects outside of screen accurate design, one of the biggest choice innovations was the creation of the Zord Builder gimmick on the original Dino Megazord. The new take on their first ever Megazord, apparently they were unable to remold from the original casts from the 90s, gave them a sleeker, more humanoid design to the Megazord while keeping it in modern price points. The release still only costs $25. However, it was full of compromise, missing turning wheels, lacking in paint detail, and with some strangely coloured parts and stickers. It also wouldn't be built up to an Ultra Zord with a Dragon Zord skipped over and a Titanus uh, playset being the only other Zord release from the line. While some diehard fans had bought what was at the time only the second combining version of Dino Megazord ever released, Bandai would find a way to repurpose these moulds for the Legacy Edition. They would go on to replace at least one part on each Zord with a die cast piece, adding considerable weight to the toy and giving it more of a collector look when combined into its robot form. This time they would resolve a lot of the compromised paint choices and fix the stickers into a metallic style to match the die cast and collector finish. Following on from the Power Morpher, the box would also get the 90s nostalgia look, taking design cues from the original toy box. Altogether, they had turned their $30 Zord Builder entry line Megazord into a $60 collectible any nostalgic fan would want. The Megazord released in mid 2013 and would repeat the sellout act of the Power Morpher, quickly causing Toys R Us to tack another $10 onto the selling price. The two new products did more to cause a stir in the adult Power Rangers collector market than anything that had ever come before. It didn't matter that they weren't watching and perhaps weren't even aware that Power Rangers was continuing to show new seasons on TV, because here were two products based on their childhood that were aimed squarely at adults that were fun to own and priced quite reasonably for considering how niche they were. There was a third Toys R Us exclusive legacy product in that first year of the line, one that passed under the radar of most for being a bit uninspiring and people not really knowing what to do with it. The Legacy Mask Collection was a mounted display stand of the first six Mighty Morphin Power Ranger helmets in a shrunken sized scale. Think home office display rather than something you could interact with. 
and it was only around $30, a total bargain really. It was the first time we'd gotten an official way to collect merch depicting the helmets. They were basically an extension of the Red Hero helmets being put out by Bandai Japan for Super Sentai, and so are the only legacy product to kind of be sourced from something from Japan. Worth mentioning the extra figures that appeared outside of the Power Rangers Legacy branding too. Prominently the metallic figures that appeared as part of the horrible 4 inch scale action figures of red and white. Again, re-releases of the moulds from 2010 figures. Also a putty patroller was randomly re-released. And of course the armoured figures for red and white. They were given Megaforce trading cards and general package design and also had the Power Rangers 20 logo on. I love those things. I was in America in summer 2013. I managed to get both of them on clearance in Target. But those figures were never thought of as legacy figures, despite the Armored Red appearing on both boxes for the Power Morpher and Megazord. Fans were ravenous and wanted more. Bandai heard that they wanted more. Toys R Us knew they wanted more. And there was so much potential for what they could do next. Power Rangers Legacy products wouldn't just be a market for the 20th anniversary, it was going to become part of the franchise's product offering. The next year Bandai weren't playing around, Megaforce was becoming Super Megaforce and with it a toy line that reflected back the 20 year history of the franchise throughout its figures, zords and especially roleplay gimmick. But while they would just touch on each season through a red and six ranger in the new 5 inch scale, they would give Mighty Morphin the red carpet treatment, with a new pricier tier complete with painted accessories and the 90s nostalgic triangular box design based on the versions that the original 8 inch figures were first sold in. Retroactively known as the first legacy figures, the 2014 set gave us our first team of Mighty Morphin with painted combinable weapons. You still needed the basic green and red ranges as the legacy versions were armoured red and the first ever fighting spirit green figures, but at least their weapons were still painted and right for the basic fix. But it wouldn't just be figures that Bandai were developing as sequels to their more phenomenal 2013 releases, they had another Morpher and crucially another Zord ready to go. Completionists were never going to be happy with just 5 of the 13 power coins and especially not without Tommy's green and white ranger versions to complete the main Mighty Morphin team. Bandai were also getting in on the convention game and brought to market the initial version of the green ranger and white ranger edition legacy power morpher to San Diego Comic Con in 2013. The release was cast in 24 karat gold plating making Tommy's morpher not just die cast but shiny at that. While not screen accurate to Mighty Morphin, it would go on to be the basis of the Master Morpher seen in the 25th anniversary special. If you missed one of the limited batch though, or weren't at the convention, Bandai luckily produced the more screen accurate matte gold version for their 2014 Toys R Us exclusive release. Two more weathered coins matched the first set, and this was notable for being the first gold version of the Power Morpher ever released anywhere in the world. Yeah, even Z Ranger didn't manage to make one of these. The excitement would continue with the announcement and release of Legacy Dragon Zord, the first true Legacy Zord as it was not based off a previous release and wow, this took the line up a tier again. Gone were stickers as every screen accurate detail was painted in on top of the robot. Diecast was used extensively in the gold shoulders and heavy dragon's feet on the Zord. There were interesting prototype photos that appeared on the Bandai UK Facebook that seemed to show it with chromed gold shoulder and chest pieces rather than the matte gold we would get on the final toy. They would still find a way to use the shiny version in a future black and gold version of the toy though. The new design pulled double duty as they had designed it to be compatible with their legacy Megazord. No, it wasn't quite the slam dunk design wise as the original 90s toys were as they were designed to intentionally fit together. But Bandai America had weighted the design towards the separated modes more prominently and they didn't do a bad job with the combinations. They're some of the most famous secondary Zord configurations of the franchise and they were all achievable with this duo. Legacy Dragon Zord actually had the counterintuitive effect of making the cons of the Legacy Megazord more apparent. 
specifically the cheap reuse of the 2010 design and having stickers when the new Zord exclusively relied on painted detail. But you know, there was something nostalgic about having stickers to apply to a Megazord again, and while I don't think they should do it anymore, I think not having a roadmap was what hurt the cohesiveness of the first season Legacy Zords. The weight of the die cast in the Dragon Zord would also become a bit of a hindrance in combined modes. Their ode to the Green Ranger continued. In 2013, pictures had leaked of the legendary battle that showed Jason David Frank back on set in New Zealand for the first time in 10 years. He was joined by various other legendary rangers, but MMPR Green was always going to be the headline grabber because it was such an iconic character from season one. The episode would air towards the end of 2014, and so it made sense for Bandai to continue with another fan-requested item, the Legacy Dragon Dagger. Seeming giant size when compared to the original plastic 90s version, this new incarnation was quickly establishing the Legacy line's quality standards mantra, with updated sounds and theme song, die-cast features, and even 24 karat gold plating, just like the SDCC Morpher had. The new Dragon Dagger was another absolute win, with a secondary set of sounds that unlocked when you held in the mouthpiece, like the Legacy Power Morpher that preceded it in the roleplay scale, it would become the most comprehensive and spectacular looking incarnation of the Green Ranger signature weapon to date. We wondered, did this mean Bandai were going to delve into the rest of the power weapons? Would they combine into the power blaster? Was that even possible? It was definitely an exciting time for fan expectations and possibilities. The second year of the Legacy line rounded out with the biggest, most expensive item to date, the $200 Legacy Titanus. The final Zord of Season 1 allowed you to complete your Legacy Ultra Zord, and unlike the Mix and Morph base station from 2010, what was going on there? This was a total remold, once again with painted details used instead of stickers and die cast, thankfully used much more sparingly than on the Dragon Zord. Bandai were also aware of the problems they'd created by making the Dragon Zord quite so heavy. The knee joints of the T Rex Zord were prone to buckling under the weight of it, and so Bandai provided some plastic reinforcement clips in the box with Titanus designed to stop it from collapsing in on itself. Once again, they had to retroactively create a toy that would fit with their 2010 $30 budget Megazord, a very backwards way of designing an Ultra Zord but we fans didn't care, we were just pleased to finally complete a new version of something that most of us had long since lost. Legacy Ultra Zord was an insane collector product, a true centerpiece for your burgeoning Mighty Morphin Legacy display. Let's just say it here and now, Bandai were doing us, the fans, a solid in the beginning stages of the Legacy line. They really invited us, and maybe even some casuals out in the fringes, back into the line at a sensible price and with compassionately created items. Yes, understandably, the prices only went up from here, but honestly, it worked for me, as I wasn't even buying Power Rangers toys back then. The anniversary line was a gateway to come back in, a brand new term that would take on its own life and logo, Legacy was how they articulated that this tier was beyond the regular version of the line. It also set out its stake for being not for kids by having the 15 plus label on most of the boxes. Now I'm sure there was nothing in these products beyond the usual 4 plus age range, but the psychology of labelling these up as now being for adults was a powerful tactic, excuse the pun. These products were a major step change. It helped that they felt both familiar, but also different to what we knew. What we didn't know was how good we had it. These days, if you put a $60, 24 karat gold dragon dagger on the shelf, people would call it a steal. But back then, some people weren't sure, they weren't used to paying that much for Power Rangers toys. Same for Titanus, which shelf warmed, ridiculous considering the effort and detail that went into it. Legacy was unfortunately a scalper's dream. You had high quality items where the toy manufacturer lost the license and then couldn't make any more. And the store they were sold at also went out of business and had to discount and clearance a lot of it. Inevitably, it created perfect conditions for scalping. 
So that's how we began the Legacy line, how blissfully optimistic we felt. It really seemed like anything could happen, and Bandai seemed receptive to the idea too when asked about the future of the line at conventions. And even with our first Ultra Zord, Figures, Weapon and Morphers, they were just getting started. So subscribe to Power Ranger Tube if you're not already, and I'll see you next time for part two where we'll cover peak legacy, the years of 2015 and 2016. See you later.